Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. We are continuing and finishing our series to the book of Matthew. We've been studying Matthew's chapter 1 through 4, and we've been talking about the origins of the Messiah. So we're going to be concluding that series, and we are hopefully, Lord willing, going to be starting the book of Isaiah and doing the first 12 chapters of that prophet. So hopefully you can be with us the following Sunday. Well, for now, if you'd open your Bibles to Matthew 4, beginning in verse 12. You know, the story of Adam and Eve is a very tragic one. Most of us know the story, but essentially what happens is that our first parents chose to reject God's authority as the universal king. And of course, it led to disastrous consequences for the history of humanity. Life on earth has become chaotic as people again and again attempt to take on God's role that was not meant for them. And and they are trying to set themselves up as king. But we see in the plot line of Scripture, in the Bible storyline, how God would not abandon His people despite their rebellion, but that He would establish His kingdom upon earth. And this is what makes our passage so exciting this morning. We are seeing prophecy fulfilled. We are seeing promises come to fruition. The day has finally come in history in which God begins to usher in his kingdom. And he does it through Jesus' public ministry. Now, despite the fact that Jesus came 2,000 years ago and, and he set his kingdom in motion we still live in a disaster of a world, don't we? From pandemics to dreadful weather to terrorism to a whole bunch of ugly stuff, we, we live in an absolute disaster. And with all that goes wrong in our world, we might be tempted to think that God's kingdom has not been ushered in, that it is not being ushered in as we speak. Things seem to just keep getting worse, at least here in the States, that is. But we can be encouraged today that despite what you and I see and despite what we experience in this life, God's kingdom is being ushered in here and now. And because God's kingdom is being ushered in as we speak, there are appropriate responses to be had and there are appropriate spiritual fruit to be seen. Or there is appropriate spiritual fruit to be seen, I'm sorry. So according to our passage, there is an appropriate manner in which we live. There is an appropriate person in whom we are to trust in. And there is appropriate evidence that God is truly at work, ushering in his kingdom. So let's study our text this morning, beginning in Matthew chapter 4, right at verse 12. Now when he heard, that is Jesus, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested... He withdrew into Galilee. So in the plot line of Scripture, Jesus has been baptized by John. He has experienced a trying time of temptation in the wilderness. Now, we don't really know how much time has gone by since that. We we don't know how much time between John's baptism of Jesus and this time in which his public ministry begins. We don't know if it was a year or a little more than that. But what we do know is that sometime after, John the Baptist was arrested. And his arrest prompts Jesus to withdraw into Galilee. Now, commentators have suggested that by withdrawing to Galilee, Jesus was attempting to keep a low political profile. Because, you see, John the Baptist was on Herod Antipas' naughty list, and anyone directly associated with John likely would make it onto Herod's list as well. And Jesus, in many ways, truly was John's successor. So perhaps some distance from John and his ministry home near the River Jordan was wise to some degree. Now, please don't read more into this than you should. Don't detect in Jesus' move here any kind of fear or him bailing out on John in any way. Jesus, of course, would become no stranger to having to courageously stand up for his authority, stand up against the authorities. But now was simply not the time. You may remember Jesus later in his ministry saying that the hour has not yet come. 
Now, although I do believe this was a choice of wisdom by Jesus, there's another more important reason for Jesus to launch his ministry in Galilee. Look with me at verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. So Matthew finds Jesus move from Nazareth to Capernaum as being significant. Matthew sees in this move an explicit fulfillment of prophecy recorded in the book of Isaiah, specifically seen in Isaiah chapter 9. So the specific quotation here is in in Matthew 4.15. Let me read it. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. So Matthew quotes the book of Isaiah. Now at this time, the book of Isaiah was about 700 years old. So 700 years earlier, when Isaiah penned this particular scripture passage, he speaks of a people that are dwelling in darkness. Now, who are these people that he is speaking about? Well, I think to answer that question, we need to unfold a bit of history here. The Israelites were God's chosen nation. He made a special relationship with Israel. He And Israel was meant to live in fellowship with God, but they had failed at that. They repeatedly lived in disobedience against their maker, even following after other gods. And later on in their history, their nation went through a terrible split. There was a southern kingdom and there was a northern kingdom. And both of them were bad, but the northern kingdom was particularly wicked. And they rejected all worship of Yahweh God and officially began to worship other gods. So the people that are dwelling in darkness here are God's people. So in its original context, 700 years earlier, Isaiah foresees a darkness falling on the land of Israel. And that darkness was the time of the exile, where Israel's enemies would conquer them and take them into captivity. But even in the face of such tragedy, Isaiah predicts that there would one day be a dawning light, and that this light would occur in the future near the tribal territories of Zebulun and Naphtali. So now, what do we do? We fast forward. We fast forward to Matthew's day. So Jesus begins his public ministry in these ancient tribal territories of Zebulun and Naphtali. So he settles in the Galilean town of Capernaum near the Sea of Galilee. So the prophet seems to be saying that The people from Galilee are the ones that will experience first this dawning light. So for Jesus to begin his public ministry in the Galilean town of Capernaum was prophecy being fulfilled. So Jesus' time in public ministry in Galilee was beginning and his message was very simple. Look at verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here's the first lesson. The appropriate manner of living in light of God's kingdom being ushered in is repentance. Now, there are quite a few scripture passages that speak of a final future kingdom. But there are other passages that speak of a kingdom beginning in some way when Jesus' ministry begins. So throughout Scripture, we we read of this careful tension throughout Scripture of a kingdom that is not yet fully here, while at the same time a kingdom that is here. So even though we're talking about the same kingdom. So because of this tension that you read throughout Scripture surrounding the kingdom, Christians distinguish between a future kingdom and an inaugurated kingdom. But what is even more important than distinguishing between those two things is Jesus' message. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Now, to repent means to turn. It means a, a change in mind and a change in life direction. Living the Christian life is a life of daily repentance. In the original language, the word repent is, is in the continuous imperative. It means, it means something that you go on doing. Surrendering to God and living the way that He desires for you to live because He is the King. So when Jesus began His public ministry, there were people that did not see repentance as the appropriate response to the kingdom of heaven being ushered in. Instead, there were those that sought to oppose Him. In fact, going further than that, there were people that didn't even care. People that were apathetic towards His coming. And I wonder where you're at this morning. I wonder where you're truly at. When you hear Jesus say, repent, when you read these words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, does this move you in any way? Does it cause your mind to drift towards some particular sin that you're struggling with in your life? Do, do Jesus' words cause you to think and to reflect upon your life? Do his words penetrate your heart? As a Christian, we, we don't live lives of repentance or, or try to because it suits us, you know, that, that we're somehow this pretty good group and it's natural for us to always repent, that we don't somehow battle sin. No, we, we live as we do as Christians, not because it suits us, but because Jesus is our King and we follow what He says. We are called to be His subjects and that means we are to listen to Him and we do what He says. And for those of us that are listening in this morning, that are currently on the edge of faith, you're lurking about wondering if this Christian life is truly for you, understand that repentance is not to be seen as some miserable thing. You know, somehow we think that it's this awful thing to do, but the perspective that we are to have is that as you think about your life and you think about turning, you think about turning, that it's actually a very glorious thing to turn from your sins and to turn from God. With the perspective of time, you'll see that it was a wonderful thing for your life. I mean, just think about the fact that as a Christian, if you've been in situations of sin for a long period of, of time, then finally think about when you get out of it. When you get out of it, you just think about how you felt that, that there was a relief. There's a relief. There's a greater focus on Jesus and his plans. Your Bible studies, they become more fruitful because you don't feel guilty while you're doing them. And I tell you today that if you are sitting on the edge of faith, wondering to yourself, if it is good for you to dive in, make the leap. Make the jump. The appropriate response to God's call of repentance is not to turn the other way and, and to, to simply just go about your day. You know, thinking about the next shareholders meeting, thinking about the next marathon that you're running, thinking about the next sale and the commission that you're going to be getting at your job, thinking to yourself about the money that you might make in the Super Bowl betting that's going on or whatever it may be. The appropriate response is not to come along and say, Jesus, I don't care for your words. I'll have none of that here. The appropriate response is to repent in light of God's kingdom being ushered in. Repent. Let's continue the story in verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee... He saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father. And followed him. Here's the second lesson. The appropriate person to commit our lives to in light of God's kingdom being ushered in is Jesus. These men were followers of John the Baptist. And they had been in relationship with Jesus in, in some respect for some time already. 
But now Jesus is calling them to enter into a greater arena of discipleship. Jesus says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they drop their nets and they follow him. Now we know from the Gospel of John that at least two of these men, Andrew and Simon Peter, had had earlier contact with both John the Baptist and Jesus down in the region of the Lower Jordan. So they weren't strangers to Jesus. They weren't strangers to his, his message. Not only that, but James and John were business partners with Peter and Andrew. And so it's no stretch to believe that Jesus didn't have some connection already with all four of these individuals. So I don't think that we're meant to see this move of them following Jesus as somehow rash, you know, somehow not thought through. I mean, this wasn't their first dealings with Jesus. That being so, the important thing to notice here is that Jesus needed to begin his ministry with committed followers of him. He needed a core group that would be loyal to him despite the circumstances. Yes, Jesus had plenty of people, plenty of crowds that would follow after him. We'll see that in a moment. But crowds can be very fickle. After all, you might remember the crowds that were chanting as Jesus was coming in, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. But then not long after, the crowds were chanting Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. One of the reasons that mass evangelism has failed is that while crowds will always be drawn to eloquent preachers and even powerful miracles, those same crowds tend to dissipate when the going gets tough, when the bad news comes, when commitments need to truly be made. And what Jesus needed was a personal connection with individuals, people that, would, that he would be able to choose to invest in on a deeper level, people to carry on the baton of faith once, once this stage of his life was done, people that would pick up their cross and carry it, people that would be loyal to him personally. And so he could nurture, he could nurture through that an intimate fellowship with these particular people. He needed disciples, disciples that, that would always be there even when they had to suffer for them, even when they were confused a bit by his teachings, even when they, 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 they watched as he died and he had to ascend. Jesus needed an inner ring of disciples that would be prepared to follow him even when he was no longer physically able to be with them. Jesus carefully, purposefully, chooses four fishermen. Now, i got to ask, what about you? What do we find these four men doing? We, we find them putting down their nets. The implication is that they left their vocation to follow Jesus. They gave up their business to follow him. Now, there's no Bible text that would suggest that you need to leave your job as an attorney and go into the ministry. That's not what is being shared here. That's not the lesson to take with you. But this passage does speak to the importance of making Jesus number one in your life. So that if there was ever a time in which you truly did have to choose between your career and Jesus, that you would choose him. Where does your loyalty lie? Is it with Jesus? Is he your number one? The disciples' radical move here teaches us that they were committed to have nothing compete, nothing compete for their attention, nothing compete to compete with Jesus for their attention. How much attention do you give to Jesus these days? I mean, it's such a time as this that's important to really reflect upon, important to think about within your life. I suppose this COVID crisis has many people's attention somewhere. It could be their health, their career, their families, their savings account, perhaps, a vacation, trying to find time away to have some sense of normalcy. Now, I'm not saying in any way that these are bad things. I'm not saying that at all, that they shouldn't have some of our attention. But Jesus should not have to compete 
with any of these things. He is our number one, and he has an agenda for you and I to follow. We see from the call of these four fishermen that they have a responsibility to participate in the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. They are to live life in such a way that they are to fish for people. That they're to fish for people. And we as disciples of Jesus Christ must participate in the proclamation and cast out lines as well. When you attend work, are you strategically finding a way to fish for people? When you go to your spin class at the gym, do spiritual conversations come up? When you you have lunch with some of your unbelieving friends, does the gospel ever leave your lips? If not, perhaps it's time that you begin to make a commitment to start casting out lines. Because the fact is, as God's kingdom is truly being ushered in, people must know that there is a person that they can turn to. They must know this. And they are to commit their lives to this person. They're they're to commit their lives to him. They are to commit their lives to Jesus. But if they don't know who this guy is, if if they don't know who their God is, how will they commit? Verse 23. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they, began, and they, they brought him all the sick and those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea from beyond the Jordan. Here's the last lesson. The appropriate spiritual fruit to examine and light of God's kingdom being ushered in is the evidence of changed lives. Galilee had become the first place to experience this this dawning light Now, there were all kinds of people that claimed to be the Messiah in the first century, just as there are people that are out there claiming to be the Messiah today. Everything from the retired Siberian traffic cop named Vissarion to the cross-dressing former British spy named David Spiler, there will always be people that will come along and will claim to be the Messiah, that will claim to be the Son of God. But I tell you, it's always the same things. It's always the same things with these kinds of people. Many of them would give fine political speeches, well done magic tricks. Some would even be armed in pursuit of their goals. Some would even have mental health issues that they're going through. There's always something with these kinds of people. But Jesus doesn't fit into any of those categories. Jesus stands out as unique. Jesus was a busy itinerant preacher, as we're seeing here. He'd go through Galilee teaching people about what the Old Testament had to say, sharing how he is consistent with the Scripture's teaching of what the Messiah was to look like. There was no mental health issues. No, he was sharp as a tack as he would exegete and explain the Scriptures to people. And he would heal people with with every manner of disease. There there was no sleight of hand. There was no convincing people that they were healed when truly there was nothing that actually happened to them. He truly performed miracles. Those oppressed by demons were finally free of them. Those that that, that had seizures now experienced calm, paralytics. They, They could now move about in whatever way they choose. The evidence that the kingdom of God was being ushered in was at hand. And it was found in the countless changed lives that Jesus left in his path. You know, the greatest miracle today is not for a paralytic person to get up and walk. 
The greatest miracle is not for demons to be exercised. The greatest miracle is not for aches and pains to disappear. But the greatest miracle is when God heals a person's soul. Much better than those physical miracles that Jesus did in his public ministry were the spiritual ones. Week after week, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Now that word gospel means good news. And the good news is that Jesus Christ had come to save them. He devoted his life to it. He devoted the three years of his public ministry to share with people that were sinners that he had come to save them. Now for us today, the gospel is the good news. That Jesus Christ came and he died 2,000 years ago. He rose again in the place of sinners so that today all who repent of their sins and believe in him will not suffer God's wrath, but they will be forgiven. Even though God's kingdom is being ushered in, this life is certainly very tough. The Bible never promises that it's going to be easy for you. I can't promise you that the Lord will heal you of all your diseases. I can't even promise you that that you're not going to die tomorrow. But what the Bible does promise you is that Jesus will heal your soul if you only repent. He will change your life spiritually. Change your mind about who Jesus is and turn in faith to him and seek his forgiveness. If you do that today, an amazing thing can happen. Other Christians can point to you as being even more evidence that the Son of God has come And that his kingdom is currently being ushered in. Let's bow our heads. You be praying. I'll pray in a moment. Maybe today you'd like to give your life to Christ. There's going to be a number on the screen. I'd love to talk with you. That number you can even text. We can dialogue by text. We can dialogue by phone call. Maybe today you want to place your faith in Christ. Maybe today you'd like to be baptized. Call, let's talk about that. Baptism is a public profession of your faith. So we can chat more about that. Maybe you just realize that in light of God's kingdom being ushered in, you've not responded appropriately. You've been living for your career. You've been living simply for your family, for some hobby. Who knows? But you realize I need to repent and commit my life to Jesus. I I encourage you to have a talk with your God about that. And if you need prayer, you can call or text, and I can pray with you. Father, thank you so much for your wonderful word. May we carry this treasure with us in the next couple weeks and reflect upon your passage here in Matthew 4. Reflect upon our duties as your subjects, as followers of you. Please help us, King. Live in light of your kingdom. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Hoping to see you live in our sanctuary very soon. God bless you in the way.